By the time George Washington was 16 years old, he had copied out by hand into his personal notebook 110 rules of civility and decent behavior in company and in conversation. They're based on a set of rules composed by French Jesuits in 1595. These were the rules that governed Washington's behavior and helped to mold the man who attracted the love, loyalty, and respect of all who served him during the American Revolution and his presidency. You know, it might be easy to dismiss these rules as outdated and appropriate to a time of 250 some years ago, but the rules address more. It's moral issues indirectly, and they reflect a focus that is increasingly difficult to find in our society today. The rules have in common a focus on other people rather than the narrow focus of their own self-interest that we find so prevalent today. They represent more than just manners. They are small sacrifices that we should all be willing to make for the good of all and the sake of all living together. Servanthood, as today's readings proclaim, those who wish to be first are to be servants to others. These rules of civility proclaim our respect for others and in turn give us this gift of self-respect and heightened self-esteem. The Jesuits who first composed them and Washington who copied and more importantly lived by them were outlining a system of appropriate conduct and civility. Washington's first biographer, Mason Weems, wrote of, him, wrote of him that it was no wonder everybody honored him who honored everybody. No wonder everyone honored Washington because Washington honored everybody. Among some of those 110 rules, I'm not going to read all 110, but I do have a few of them. Treat everyone with respect. Every action done in company ought to be with some sign of respect to those that are present. Be considerate to others. Don't embarrass them. Reproach no one if they have an infirmity, nor delight in teasing them. Don't show glad at the misfortune of another, even though he might be your enemy. Don't draw attention to yourself. In writing or speaking, give everyone their due. Don't argue. Submit your ideas with civility and humility. Don't make fun of anything that's important to others. Don't mock or jest of anything of importance. If you criticize someone else of someone, something, make sure you're not guilty of it yourself. Actions speak louder than words. Do not curse, insult, nor disparage anyone. Never break the rules. A person should not overly value their own accomplishments, much less their riches, the greatness of his virtue, or their family heritage. Do not apt to relate news if you do not know the truth thereof. Do not speak badly of those who are not present. And the last one, which I think is the best, Labor to keep alive in your breast that little spark of celestial fire called conscience. In 2003, Archbishop Timothy Dolan, who was then the Archbishop of Milwaukee, was invited to be the guest speaker at a joint session of the Wisconsin legislature. He spoke on civility. 
He stressed that civility is the cement that keeps a respectful, trusting, productive society and community focused and fruitful. Noting that self-respect and respect for others is essential, he stated, a civil person is deferential and sensitive to those who are in need, especially the weak, the, the, weak, the sick, the elderly, the poor, the handicapped, the young, and defenseless, adding that the civil person is also a person of hospitality, temperance, honesty, and gratitude. In his concluding remarks, the Archbishop said, you know, of all things I could have spoken about to such a prominent group of leaders, and here I'm speaking on something as simple as, as civility. I do so because if we lose this, and we're in danger of doing so, we'll lose our noble battles on all those other towering challenges. Sometimes we can't do much about all those other issues, but we can always do something about courtesy and civility. Sometimes more important than what we do is how we do it. I do believe that our society's speech and actions, especially in the public forum, has certainly declined in civility. Self-service seems to have replaced servant leadership. The principle of service is what separates true leaders from glory seekers. Jesus, the perfect leader, served his people. All of our gospel, all of our readings today, from, Jer from Isaiah, Paul's epistle, and especially Mark's gospel, identify Jesus as the perfect servant leader. To love is to serve, and God is love. The request of James and John reflects an ambition gone wrong, an ambition for power and honor for the sake of ego, for recognition, rather than an ambition to do great things in service to others. Therein lies the heart of today's gospel. Do we have the ambition to do great things, or do we desire to have people notice us doing great things? To love is to serve, and God is love. James and John asked to be on Jesus' right and left when he comes into his glory. Ironically, when Jesus did come into his own glory on the cross, it is two thieves who are on his right and left. To love is to serve, and God is love. May our actions and speech always be with civility, and in speaking to God, may we always speak with love about the one who is love.